<laughs> anyway, uh, it was an incredible experience to interview both Thomas Arst and Murray Stein, who have put three years into this project, Jung's Red Book for Our Time project. And one of the interesting things that Dr. Arst brought up was the uh, fact that he has is collaborating with some people in Germany, a bookmaker in Germany. And I don't mean the, the betting type, but a, um, a book producer uh, who builds hand books. And that book producer is creating a a red book that one can buy and use. I, I'll bring up the little video that he created and just see if we can play it here. If I can, this will show you what the product is. It's quite interesting. And if you, if we don't see it here, um, then let's see, this is an MP4. And with any luck, uh, Let's see. Just see if I can play it. Well, I just want to play there. Just uh, try to play it in quick time. <clears throat> you have to share a screen, right? Yeah, I have to share a screen, but I first have to get it onto my screen. That's oh, the, okay. That's the trick. And uh, so I think this will work. I hope. Okay, now let me share if I can. It, it actually shouldn't matter if you can't hear this uh, because this gentleman is speaking in German and I don't know how many of us can read or understand German per se. Um, but what he's showing here, if you are following this, is he's showing this red book that they are producing. And it comes in a cassette, uh, what he calls a cassette, which is this lovely box that it comes in. And this is a blank red book. And so it's exactly the same as what Dr. Young started to work with in 1913. And one of the things that Dr. Young recommended to people is that they create their own red book. And so here's the opportunity to do that. And Dr. Arst, yeah, this, is, this video is also appended, by the way, uh, to the interview yesterday at the end of it in the outtakes and so you can hear the German there if you like um, but what it, what they're going to demonstrate next here is the um, the actual production process which is quite intensive but it's uh, it's going to make a, a beautiful heirloom for people and as soon as I heard about this and Thomas held it up to me during the interview yesterday, I immediately wanted one. <laughs> I immediately coveted one, and and uh, Tom, I, want, I want one too. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a great idea. Yeah, and so um, Thomas uh, is reluctant. This is hand handmade, uh, handmade product, so it's um, not cheap. And so anyway, I think it's well worth it for anybody that's involved with Jungian psychology, psychology, definitely one should want it. Yeah, and, ideas about the cost. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, leave that for the moment. Oh, and, okay. okay. <laughs> um, you can take a guess, but I, I'm, I'm I'm going to leave that to Thomas to, to uh, talk about, but he's going to produce 10 of them at the moment. That's his plan. And 
this is the production process that you're seeing here. And this lady is showing a photograph of the actual red book. And she's showing the process of embossing this, uh, various other things that they do to make this book. And <clears throat> Dr. Young highly recommended at one point that people create their own red book as a way of referring back to numinous points in their life, if nothing else. And it seems to me that it's just a precious and um, precious heirloom to pass along to your heirs, if nothing else. And, uh, you know, I already have a large body of work that I can include in it. And I asked Dr. Arst to have the, um, the case include within it a couple of pockets that you could use for a hard drive or some thumb drives so that you could include uh, electronic um, material into it. And uh, that, I think that's a concession that we need to make to the 21st century. But anyway, uh, that is the playthrough of that. And so I am going to cease the share at this point. And so anyway, that's a little hint for the future. It's exciting. And I don't know when it'll be ready. Uh, Dr. Dr. Arst didn't tell me when he was going to have the first production of 10 created, but I think it's, he's planning to do it quite soon. And he just now, I just had an email from him just before I came on and he asked me to put the uh, entire uh, video onto the YouTube channel. And I said, okay, but let's have it in English <laughs> and a pointer to the website and a couple of other things. So he's, uh, you know, he's very amenable to doing that. And I think he's going to have a demand for far more than 10. And so let's see how that goes. Um, and so that's that. Um, and One of the things that I talked to Dr. Stein and Dr. Arst about yesterday, which I think it was important and they, they did too, was the fact that there's a range of opinions out there in the world about whether people should do active imagination. And uh, it came up because in the last essay of this book, Dr. Eisenstadt basically gave a green light saying, go ahead and do it. And meanwhile, you know, various people over time have suggested that maybe Dr. Jung was going into a psychotic incident. And I don't think that that was true, that is true. Um, and then I read at the essay by Dr. Tosha Kawai in which he said what impressed him about the Red Book was the existence of ego in the Red Book such that Dr. Young was making, maintaining connection with his physical world. So he wasn't getting carried away with it. And um, I had a, this experience of mine in 1993 when I did stay in touch with my physical world, but I was definitely carried away by an archetype for eight months. And that emerged as a novel, fortunately at the time, because I didn't know anything about psychology at that point, really. Um, I just thought I was writing a novel. I didn't realize that I was having a, an archetypal possession and it worked out. My archetype played through to the end uh, and, but it absolutely insisted that I complete the novel. But one of the things that Dr. Stein recommended yesterday is that you limit yourself if you're doing an act of imagination to 
uh, 30 or 40 minutes a day. What I was doing was limiting myself to writing uh, 500 to 1,000 words of my novel. And so Dr. Stein mentioned three rules for how to do an act of imagination. And the first of those is whatever comes. And, and so an act of imagination, it's something like meditation, but it's quite different from meditation in many ways. Um, the Buddhists um, are out on the self end of the spectrum, while the Christians are on the ego end. And what, what the Buddhists do is they simply uh, say everything in the world is an illusion and you go into meditation and you try to block everything out. And if anything come, tries to come into your meditation, you just let it be there, but let it leave. And as Dr. Stein described it in an act of imagination, as opposed to a meditation, you enter this meditative state, but uh, the three rules are whatever comes, receive it. So instead of pushing it away, as you would as a Buddhist meditator, you receive whatever comes. Two, uh, if it moves, follow it. And uh, whatever is happening is number three, whatever is happening, get involved with that. And <clears throat> so today I was in my meditation class and I decided to see, see what happened during our very brief meditation. We do it only a 10 or 15 minute meditation each week. And what I do is my uh, colleague who provides the office has a Bacara rug on her floor. And uh, she happens to be a psychologist, although not a Jungian. And so it's a, it's a Persian rug of the Bokara design. Uh, and long before this, I've been doing that meditation group for about four years now. Long before this, I had noticed that these little mandalas that are in the middle of the Bokara would lift up and they would look like a, a pastry cup that you would put fruit in. And they looked like they had um, blueberries in them. And so I had noticed that before that whenever I was meditating and getting into that state, because in Tibetan Buddhism, you keep your eyes open, I would notice that these uh, little pastry cups with the blueberries would present themselves. <laughs> so, but I, I just would stare at that and that's all. But today I did it as an act of imagination. And so I presumed that the pastry cups with the blueberries was coming and if it moves, follow it. So I decided to fo focus on uh, the emergence of the blueberry cups and then get into whatever's happening. And so today when the blueberry cups emerged, I just focused on that action and what happened was that those blueberry cups built this pyramid and and it changed in a very significant way from previous times and i could envision myself getting down the size or less than the size half the size of these blueberry cups and walking among them uh, as if i'm looking up at the blueberry cups and that's as far as I got in my 15 minute meditation this morning. But it was quite interesting to see how differently it presented itself during, during that time, based on what Dr. Stein said. And so I guess the caveat is Dr. Stein has been practicing Jungian psychology and teaching people to actively imagine for um, perhaps uh, 25 or 30 years at least, probably more than that, maybe more like 40. And he said that only on one occasion did one woman 
become quite emotional and had to be um, sort of brought down from the ceiling by uh, a professional psychologist, but otherwise people are normally able to handle an act of imagination. And so I guess the caveat I would have is you have to stay connected to your physical life. And so Dr. Jung said actually in the Red Book that he was reminding himself every day that he was a, a doctor and he had patients that relied on, on him. And he lived at 228 Seestrasse in Kusnacht. And he had a wife and five children that relied on him. And all those, those facts of his life, he would constantly remind himself as a way to stay grounded so that he didn't float off into hyperspace. And so that's quite an interesting interview. And also the essay by Steven Eisenstadt that I put on on Sunday is incredibly interesting. Um, and and uh, in some ways quite amusing, but Steven Eisenstadt is someone who uh, de deserves our attention since he's the founder and chancellor of Pacifica Graduate Institute, which is one of the few graduate schools in the country that focuses on union psychology. And so I urge you to listen to my reading of his essay and listen to the interview uh, with Dr. Stein and Dr. Arst and uh, listen to some of the other essays that are in that series because they're truly, truly profound. Um, any comment so far? <laughs> well, that's, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what I understand is uh, Young uh, did, uh, he used active imagination, but he also used other psychological you know, techniques and stuff like that. And, uh, and most young ends use different tools. It's just a tool. So, you know, he may work through a different technique of psychology or not, but, uh, and I, I, I think it's very wise that you point out the caution, particularly if, uh, you have trouble grounding yourself, you need to take it slowly and be able to come back slowly and come back. Precisely. And anything that you do, for instance, in yoga, when we teach yoga, we make sure that we uh, come up with a grounding exercise, whether it's just jumping up and down and grounding yourself, you know, getting in touch back with the reality, because it's very easy to fly off in these things. Sure. Get lost. So it's, uh, I agree, gradual, come back, gradual, come back. Right. And if you, if you, you know, if you really get too out of uh, bounds there, I would suggest that you get some help or at least talk to someone who could get you back down because it's, it's very dangerous to be. Fun. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think people like you and me can at least talk to someone sensibly about, about it or not. Yeah. Cause not we've, mental we've, health professionals, but we know something about it. Yeah. Well, yeah, or just, uh, actually, you know, uh, the, a lot of yoga instructors know about grounding, a, a lot of these other things. I mean, it's just a normal thing to make sure your clients don't go out of the room ungrounded. <laughs> <laughs> or float up into space. <laughs> yeah. Right. So um, I, I often make the comment that I have a, a religious experience almost every day, every day these days. And um, so I wanted to share with you a little bit about my religious experience that happened moments before we came online today. And so some of you, I know you two gentlemen do know, but others don't know that I have a six year long relationship with this woman who is um, a Palestinian, uh, she lives in, uh, or she's Gazan, and over the last three years, I've helped her um, get three fellowships to come to the United States, and the one that she's been in this summer um, is uh, one that 
gave her the opportunity to um, to uh, intern in a congressional office. And it so happened that she had the opportunity to um, intern in the office of Ilhan Omar. And so I said, wow, <laughs> talk about out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> because here she is in Gaza. She's lived through three wars and one rebellion called an intifada. And one of her close friends was uh, murdered by an Israeli sniper last year during the March for March of return. He was a, a newspaper man or press man, and he was wearing his press outfit that said press across his chest. And um, he was he was video recording uh, the March of Return last March, I believe, in 2018. And a sniper from the Israelis uh, decided to murder him. And it, it really uh, traumatized this young woman, uh, my friend. And then she did manage to uh, get this internship here. And what happens, she ends up in the office of Ilhan Omar during this time right now where Omar's become part of the squad and so on. And so in this photograph, uh, which was taken uh, 10 days ago, uh, Lana is giving her talk to the U.S. House of Representatives um, in their congressional forum for the program that she was in, which is a remarkable program, really. Um, and she was showing a couple of her works of art, which I've been helping her with, promoting with for the last six years since she was 15 years old. She's now 23. And uh, the two images that you see in this picture um, are two of her paintings. Uh, the one on the left uh, represents a woman as, um, as the sunflower that is looking up at Apollo as he goes across the sky and always following the sun as the sun goes across the sky. And she gave this painting to uh, Representative Omar. And uh, the one on the right uh, is called um, The Martyr's Mother Kept the Governor Waiting at the Peace Ceremony. And, and this painting is now hangs over my desk, right? I can look up and see it over my computer. And, um, and so I'm quite proud of Lana. And so she, her program finished yesterday and she's going to spend a month with us. So I may have her make a cameo, a cameo appearance uh, before she goes back to uh, Qatar uh, at the end of the month, uh, at the end of August and does a second year. She's, she won herself a scholarship for a master's degree in journalism from uh, a graduate school in Doha, Qatar, and she's completed one year of it. So she's going back for her second year uh, shortly, but she's one of my, uh, I would say my Pygmalion uh, creations. <laughs> I've had a few, but, but anyway, I'm very proud of Lana and what she's achieved over the last six years. And it, it started, uh, some of you know that I got involved in a play that went on in uh, Istanbul, Turkey uh, in 2013, um, which led to uh, the playwright, uh, two key actors and a key uh, administrator of the play uh, being exiled for Turkey from Turkey and I had played in every performance of that play. So it was, uh, 
my name was also on it. And anyway, so I won't go into that. There's a, if you look at, um, If you look at archetypeinaction.com and you look under featured authors, and I'm one of the featured authors, uh, which is my prerogative as also the, the only uh, curator of that site, archetypeinaction.com. But if you go in there, you can find a, a uh, 3,000 word essay on what happened to me with the, with the play. Um, and it's the essay is called uh, I am guilty I am a provocateur and uh, that you shouldn't take that directly seriously I was not a provocateur I was simply um, I just simply met some people online and I got involved in helping them produce their play which included an online element and but that play was accused by the Erdogan government of uh, causing the Gezi Park demonstration in 2013. And so my four friends became exiles from Turkey. Um, but before they did, or about the same time they did, uh, my Turkish friend had introduced me to Lana, somebody who I might want to promote on the website. And so if you go to that website, archetypeinaction.com, uh, you can see some of the other things that I've published of Lanus uh, and see some of the progression of this process. In 2015, for the fifth anniversary of the website, uh, I ran a global art contest um, to have some artist provide an image that represented the work of Dr. Carl Jung. And uh, Lana produced a, an amazing painting that, or it's, it's really sort of, yeah, I guess it's a painting or a, a might, might be a color pencil drawing, but it's, it's very powerful and it clearly indicates her understanding of Dr. Jung's work. And this was four years ago, so she was 19 at the time and she was able to put it all together and um, and win the global contest. And so anyway, that's my experience with Lana. Um, any comments? So, uh, Virtus says, good evening, Thomas. Um, Virtus says, what are your thoughts on the significance of blood and O blood? Do, do anybody, do, do any of you know what that re is reference to? Miles or Jerome, do you have any idea what that reference is? I don't, I don't know what you mean, Virtus, so. I, I don't. Okay, well, <laughs> it's a, it's a pretty broad statement unless I understand the statement because obviously blood has uh, all kinds of meanings. And uh, I actually uh, wrote a book in 2007 called Tsunami of Blood, which you can find online uh, on Amazon. But um, in this case, I don't know what O blood is uh, unless that's a uh, it's a blood type or something. So please, if you, uh, Virtus, if you just uh, type into the chat uh, a little bit more description of what you're referring to, I'll be happy to comment. But so far, I don't have anything I can say. Um, so let's see. Okay. So I wanted to. Um, Oh, so anyway, I had a synchronicity with Lana because just before we began tonight, uh, she came in. And if you looked at the interview yesterday uh, of Dr. Stein and Dr. Arst, you will have heard Dr. Stein tell the story that a, one of the grandchildren of C.G. Young had told him that Dr. Young carried with him a Bible in his pocket. Uh, and in any spare moment he had, he would be 
seen reading the Bible, and he was quite um, quite well versed in the Bible. And uh, so, no more than ten minutes before I began tonight's session, um, Lana came in and told me that she had been to something like a county fair, and someone had come over to her and given her two Bibles, which she wanted to give to me. And so she gave me these two pocket Bibles. <laughs> and I haven't thought about having a pocket Bible in a long while. And so all of a sudden, Dr. Stein mentions that, and now I have a pocket Bible. This, this one happens to be in Spanish. So, um, so we have somebody running around the county fairs giving away uh, pocket Bibles, and I will make good use of this one. Uh, and uh, it's quite an interesting synchronicity to me. Um, and uh, no, that was one synchronicity that happened today. Another one was that during my, uh, mind you, my Buddhist meditation group, which includes five local psychologists, none of them Jungian, um, I mentioned that I might give a talk on uh, finding the living God. And I had mentioned it to Mary yesterday also, and uh, you can hear him react on the video. But I said that, uh, I, I said this to my colleagues in the meditation group, and they said, uh, oh, would you like to do that in uh, cooperation with ACT, which is uh, an organization that's affiliated with Unity by the Bay, where I'm thinking of giving this talk. And so all of a sudden we got into some serious planning and thinking about how that could happen. And uh, she was offering three different alternatives. So uh, I don't know where we're going, but we're going. Any other, co any comments, folks? <laughs> Before I move on. Hey, uh, Skip, I just happened to remember about the, uh, maybe what uh, uh, Thomas Dennis was referring to on blood type. I think he's talking about like O type blood. And what's interesting <laughs> is VTS, uh, when they list their uh, Myers Briggs types and their, their, all their profiles, uh, something about that culture believes in listing the type of blood that they have. Hmm. And so you'll see some of them with type O, some of them with type A, and so forth. So there is a significant uh, something about the blood type with the, I guess, the uh, Koreans in terms of... Oh, 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 is that what it means? It, it, this wasn't Thomas that put that up there. It's so oh, I'm sorry, Virtus 1, oh, I, I misread. I, Vir, Virtus 108, put that yeah. up. But yeah, it might be O minus blood. And so. Well, and there's also, uh, if you look at some, of, there's been some books written about diet and blood type. So if you look at from that standpoint, there's a doctor that's written a lot of books about uh, your diet and how your blood type is affected by it and it affects your metabolism and so forth. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I've never gotten into that much. I do know that O minus blood is quite a bit less common than O positive. Uh, I think it may be 5% of the population. I happen to have O positive blood, which means I can give blood to anyone. Yeah. Um, I have A or something like that. That's and, and blood type is significant if you're going to the hospital. I mean, my brother died from uh, Mountain Spring Water in Vail, Colorado, uh, because he got a Girardia in his colon, and it worked up over 15 years. It worked up into his liver and ate his liver. And when he finally had a, a liver transplant and ultimately he had three. Um, he was uh, one of the, one of the first liver transplant recipients in the, in the very early days when they were doing it. And the first, my parents were there, were required to be there when he was in, in a hospital. 
And the first time uh, it took 18 hours, the procedure. And then he rejected that liver after uh, about six weeks. And then they decided to give him another liver. And so, and so they told my parents, well, this will be a much quicker operation because we don't have to do as many careful new cuts in order to get into the right place. And so they estimated that the surgery would be eight hours instead of 18. And, and um, so my parents were there waiting for the doctors to come out and they didn't come and they didn't come and they didn't finally come until um, 24 hours later. And what happened was they had installed the second liver into my brother and they realized that it had failed immediately and they had one more liver coming in uh, at that moment and they were in the middle of the surgery and they were on a break when this happened. I mean, they had installed the second liver, they were on a break, third liver, and then the liver failed and a third liver came in to the hospital uh, and they installed that. So he took the third liver and that liver was a different blood type from my brother. And uh, he subsequently had sepsis and died. Um, but anyway, nowadays, apparently they can do a partial liver transplant. So I could have, if today, today is as today is, I could have given my brother a part of my liver and saved his life. But, um, but that wasn't possible in 1988. And interestingly enough, the hospital that has done the most research on the partial liver transplant is King Faisal Hospital in Saudi Arabia, where I did quite a bit of work back in the, in the early 2000s, from 2002 to 2008. And yeah, I think the, the liver is the only organ in the body that can regenerate itself. Uh, so that's why the partial thing comes through. So yeah, it works. Yeah, technology helps sometimes. You know? <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, those are a lot of personal stories there. So let us move on. Um, what I want to do is just read a, a page uh, from this book, Trauma and the Soul, Psycho-Spiritual Approach to Human Development and Its Interruption by Donald Kalshid, and then ask for your comments and your own experiences, because I think these experiences are fairly common. Um, and so this, this uh, chapter nine of this book on page 282, um, it's, the title of it is Dismemberment and Rememberment, uh, Reflections on a Case of Embodied Dreamwork in Light of Grimm's Fairy Tale, The Woman Without Hands. And then there's a brief poem, uh, which re refers, I think, to individuation. And so I just read that to you. The bud stands for all things, even those things that don't flower. For everything flowers from within of self-blessing. Though sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on its brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch, it is lovely until it flowers again from within of self-blessing. And so that, the reason I think of that is, um, and that's from a poem called uh, St. Francis and the Sow from 1993 by a man named Galway Kimmel. Um, but it referred me to the idea that every oak tree is an oak tree, but every oak tree is different. And so one of Dr. Jung's fundamental ideas is that we are all, we all have a rhizome within us. We were born to be a certain thing um, based on where we are and we need to focus on where we are. We're the perfect 
manifestation of everything that's gone on in the human species from uh, the beginning of life. And we need to focus on how we can make that better. Uh, and that will be the meaning of our life or not. But anyway, that's what individuation is about. And so anyway, let me just read this first page here. Um, in this chapter, we will look at an individual case against the backdrop of a popular Grimm's fairy tale, The Woman Without Hands. In uh, this case, with the fairy tale amplification alongside it, illustrates how early emotional trauma can freeze the bud of a person's developing life and prevent it from flowering through an inner process of dismemberment and negation known as dissociation. After dissociation, defenses have dominated and subjected the inner world. It is, it is necessary, as Kinnell says in our epigraph, to reteach a thing its loveliness until it's, it flowers again from within of self-blessing. Such reteaching is a more complicated process than simply loving someone back into health. In the, psychoanal in the psychoanalytic process, it means following the patient's life narrative back to those places that are still unstoried, where the original developing loveliness of the person's life was interrupted by pain that was simply too much for the child to bear. Such pain triggers primitive psychological defenses, and these in turn open gaps or faults in the landscape of the patient's evolving emotional and mental life. These ruptured places prevent the flowering from within of the patient's true potential. The bud, which we might think of as the imperishable personal spirit or soul, in order for this bud to flower again, from within the gaps of the patient's life nar narrative created by violence of dissociation must eventually be filled in with personal suffering. This entails a mutual journey into the nether regions of the patient's history, a journey such as that of Dante and Virgil in chapter three of this book, but he's referring to the Divine Comedy, of course and requires careful attention to the unconscious, as well as to the body where many of the traumatic memories are encoded as psychosomatic symptoms. The case that follows of my work with Deborah illustrates such a mutual journey. In Jungian psychoanalysis, dreams are the via regia to the re-experiencing of the hellish dissociative places in the traumatized psyche. Both the, case, both the case that follows and the fairy tale alongside it give us um, disturbing images of these dismembered places in the psyche, images of chopped up or eviscerated bodies, split off limbs, etc. The revisit to revisit these places of unremembered trauma outpictured by these images is often terrifying for the patient. And yet Deborah knew she had to go there. She told me in her first session that she had spent much of her life either frozen in fear or dissolved in a kind of nameless despair over her mother's incessant criticism, neglect, and violence. My mother's rage, my mother's rages terrified me, she said. I lived a life of constant vigilance and fear of her. I would cringe every time she entered a room, and I'm still cringing now whenever that fear returns. My spirit was crushed by my mother, and I don't know how to get it back. Deborah's mother had died a year before our analytical adventure began, but this did not keep her voice from constantly menacing Deborah's inner world. Deborah had always been a very sensitive, shy and vulnerable little girl and these qualities together with her premature birth her first week was spent in an incubator and a near-death experience in her first year of life set the stage for an infancy and childhood of painfully unmet dependency needs and terrifying effects 
she simply could not metabolize on her own. She was the fourth child in a family of 10 children, and her parents were often overwhelmed or absent. Her alcoholic mother began disciplining each child as soon as it became independent. This often meant physical abuse. Besides her own regular spankings, Deborah witnessed her siblings being hit and beaten, sometimes with sticks or coat hangers, to the point of bloodletting. Frozen inside, she would listen to the screaming from another room, trying to remain invisible and waiting for a better time. Her terror was overwhelming and made for the kind of emotional trauma that often leads to dissociation and fragmentation of a child's inner world, as well as to the major separation between the body and the mind. And so the reason I wanted to read that, I know that most of the people that listen to this website uh, are, or to this YouTube channel are men, but I know lots of men who uh, were abused by their fathers uh, and it it often happens in military families, sadly, uh, did not happen in mine. Uh, my father was um, a true gentleman, but I knew many young men my own age who suffered with alcoholic fathers and who suffered very serious penalties, you know, um, whippings with switches and all kinds of things during their growing up years. So it occurred to me that um, there are many who um, might listen to this who may have had such a trauma, uh, much as Deborah had the trauma in this description, and who might benefit by reading this book. Um, and uh, and so that's why I wanted to mention that and give our panel opportunity to comment. But anyway, I'm reading from Trauma and the Soul uh, by Dr. Donald Kalshin. Any comments, gentlemen? I'll have a, put in a comment here. Um, one of the things that I'm recognizing is that, you know, indeed, loneliness is epidemic in our society. And I live in a very prosperous city, yet in order for people to convene, you, you have to actually do, it, it's, it's a formal process. It's not something that we do spontaneously any, anymore. And uh, we uh, have lost what I would imagine not too long ago was something that just happened spontaneously where people just gathered around in a circle, you know, around a campfire. Um, now today it's okay, you have to book a hall or as you're doing, you're considering a church. And I'm not sure how this really relates to what you just read, but you know, we need to really think how can we get back to being more spontaneous and coming together as people instead of being in our very comfortable boxes that we all live in and we go in and out of garage doors and you know, often barely even wave to neighbors anymore. Anyway, don't even get thoughts. out of the car normally. <laughs> in a lot of yeah, we got those remote controls to push a button. You drive in. You don't even have to say hello to anybody anymore. Anyway, it's uh, and we have now the isolating technology of all these devices, which are wonderful because we're using one right now, each of us. But by the same token, it's very easy to just live in these screens um anyway just shared those thoughts maybe you want to discuss how you are dealing with trying to come up with ways to go and present on the topic of the living god and i just say you know one of the best things perhaps to do would be to 
you know, if since it's the living God, if you could do your presentation in a natural setting, I'm looking out at flowers in my garden and I'm, you know, just marveling about the beauty of the color and the perfection of the mandala shape of the petals. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, I'm going to shut up until I hear whether Jerome has something to add here. Okay, I want to share something. So uh, let me see if this works. Okay. Does it work? Yes. Oh, okay. This is from my red book. <laughs> and you were talking about the flame and the kernel. And as you can see, this is my representation. And there's a, it, you, you know, you can interpret it different ways, but as you can see, there's a lot of imagery that came through this. And this is something that just spontaneously came up. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was trying to explain what the flame and the kernel is uh, to my son, who is an INTJ. And so mm -hmm. he was having trouble figuring out, you know, particularly intuitives, they always uh, have trouble in the extroverted uh, world, you know, the, the introverted types. And so right. we, we have to adapt to that. But anyway, as part of the process of going through this, this was one of my images from my red book. So I thought I would share it at least to give you an idea because you were talking about the kernel and the flowering. And if you look at that, uh, maybe you can see some imagery involved in it so right and and so the the critical thing that dr kalshit is bringing to our attention a few things but one of them is that when you have a trauma like this you have a protective system that protects that kernel okay it pretends it protects that inner flame but the problem is it dissociates it um it protects it in your somatic body, but it dissociates it from your spiritual body. Right. And what we need to have is linkage between our spiritual body and our uh, somatic body, right. physical body. And, you know, basically that's what we've lost now with Christianity in the United States, as near as I can tell, um, because... Um, they want to do everything about the word and rationality and God doesn't live there. <laughs> God lives, God lives in the, in life. And uh, let's see, I, what yeah. has happened. No, I shared it. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm going to exit full screen so I can see the rest of my screen. Yeah, that's a problem. When you share, it goes full screen. <laughs> right. So I'm going to share with you, uh, just in response to your point, um, in response to your point, um, Miles, here's the venue that I'm thinking of including um, or using, which is called Unity by the Bay. And, oh, that's beautiful. And that's that's why I'm, precisely why I want to do it in that location. Gorgeous. Uh, and, and those uh, windows are nice. Look at yeah, that. it's it's a phenomenal venue, and uh, it's you know it's an uplifting venue. Um, so anyway, that's that's my idea at the moment, and appara apparently I might get some people in the room. If I, if so I, when what day would you? present i haven't decided yet I, I i have to talk to some other people before i can make any judgment but i'm thinking sometime between mid-october and mid-november is my thought uh because i need some time to gather my own thoughts um and, so and maybe have you thought that well if there's quite an interest of uh, people wanting to come to this venue. May they, may you might to convert it into a regular meetup. I'm going to, okay. I'm going to put it out as a regular meetup among other things. Excellent. Um, I know in Calgary here, I just, just by coincidence, I was engaging people on a different subject 
and we were going to different to churches, temples, synagogues, organizations and such and giving a little presentation. And it turned out here in Calgary, the Calgary Young Society meets at a Anglican church on, I think, Wednesday evening. So I suppose churches are a good venue to investigate as yeah. to uh, holding meetups like this. Uh, another choice would be a Unitarian Universalist church. Um, but I, I think many, at least Protestant churches, might make their sanctuary available for such things. Good evening, Carlos. Welcome. And uh, let me just refer back to some of these other points. Are you for, says O plus here too, wonder if that favors uh, INTP types too? Um, good question. I just don't know. Uh, Mama Lamas uh, saying hello. Thank you for being here. Um, you often provide good comments for us. Uh, Brian says, love the content. Please keep it coming. Brent K says, I can relate to child trauma. I'm just starting Dr. Kalshit's book. Thanks for the lead to it. Mama Lama, wow. Uh, that is a beautiful painting. That, uh, and that's an amazing venue for sure. Yep, I really think that's the right place for, for this. So we'll, we'll see. One thing you might consider, Skip, is putting the chairs into a circle if they'll allow you to rearrange uh, chairs. There's a power, yeah. there's a spirit in a circle. Well, they definitely do allow that. And I've been to several events at the, in this venue and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. I'm, um, I'm conflicted about that at the moment. And so I'm open for discussion about it. Um, well, when, in group process, we use that uh, in team building because uh, it uh, uh, no one is uh, put above the other one, like standing at the podium and so forth. Uh, and it facilitates the sharing around a circle and so forth. It also dates back to the old sitting around the campfire and all that good stuff. So there's a lot of good things about that that helps people seemingly want to share and interact with each other. Plus they can see each other all around and mm -hmm. look at each other's face where if you're just sitting in an audience, you see the back of people's heads, you know? Sure. So. Uh, well, the, you know, part of this relates to the audio visual because I've always been reliant on myself for it to do all the audio visual in all my sessions. And next week we'll be at Sammy's again. And um, by the way, I did check, and there's no, um, there's no plug <laughs> near where I, uh, I do those sessions. There is a plug in the, in the other dining room, but unfortunately, that dining room is useless because it takes all the kitchen noise, yeah. and so I can't do it there. Uh, power pack, then I guess is the best thing is a charger pack. So, uh, yeah, it's complicated because of all the plugs <laughs> that are involved. Yeah, um, but okay, I might think about do doing that. But I, the problem is there's no money for it, so oh, okay. uh, I gotta. I got to go with what I've got. And so, uh, you know, I'll do my best at Sammy's as I always do, but unfortunately the, it's not the best. Uh, I'll be, I'll do my best to be more careful at least on the network next week. So I'm sure that I have a strong network connection. Yeah. Uh, you lose, you lose 1% of your power for every uh, minute that you're uh, broadcasting. So, mm -hmm. Uh, you'd be down to 40% after an hour in terms of charge if you didn't recharge your... Uh, right. IPhone. Well, that's about what it's been lasting. And unfortunately, Sammy's has been shutting down their Wi-Fi at 930, I think, to push me out. <laughs> Fair enough, because they close it then. But um, but we do have an Xfinity Wi-Fi that's, that's a public Wi-Fi uh, that 
goes in there. So I may be able to use that Wi-Fi so it's more reliable. Um, so anyway, um, going back to this trauma issue, though, uh, what Dr. Kalshid is talking about is how, um, and, and your image that you put up, Jerome, is very apt because what Dr. Kalshid is saying is that we have this self-protective system, but it, it's like the devil because it cuts us off from heaven. It protects the kernel, but there's no connection with the spiritual side of the self. And it's like being half blind, which is essentially uh, what the major religions seem to be in the, in the U.S. now, because as, as we've talked, and I'll just repeat this for others that haven't heard, but uh, as Dr. Edward Edinger points out in the creation of consciousness on the back cover, on the back cover, um, he says, um, the author proposes nothing less than a new worldview, a creative collaboration between scientific pursuit of knowledge and the religious search for meaning. Religion is based on eros, science on logos. Religion sought linkage with God, science sought knowledge. The age now dawning seeks linked knowledge. And that's what we've lost access to. I and mean, that's um, a major problem with Jordan Peterson's work because he, he is so painfully dissociated from the arrow side of his uh, being that he can't even he can't even admit that he believes in God on the logo side. Okay, he's on the logo side, and and he's saying who who dares to say they believe in God, and he's claiming that we don't have a right to say that, and and uh, you know he's done all the rational thinking about it but he's basically dissociating uh, his entire teaching from the arrows. And actually, I, I did have a, a Jungian analyst of some 40 years um, experience who said that Jordan Peterson is afraid of the chaos. And as I've said a few times, um, chaos is where life is. Okay, you can, you can think you want all this logos, all this rationality. But the problem is that, you know, university professors, they're, they, um, they stop at the water's edge kind of thing. Um, that, you know, they can, it doesn't matter how many books you read or how many papers you write or how many things they pour into your head during lectures. Once you leave college, then you have to live your life. And that happens on, the chaotic side of the table and so and and then you know as i'm listening to these theologians uh, with all due respect to my friend paul vanderclay um you know when i hear paul vanderclay talk about his religion he sounds like a lawyer making a case before a jury um and so sure, you know, some people will believe that's what a lawyer does is try to make the jury believe. And but belief is on the rational side. It's it's based on being convinced by the evidence. But God doesn't operate on that side. God operates on the on the irrational side of the lecture of the ledger. Well, well, you are a lawyer, so you should know. And uh, so, yeah, right. but anyway, it's interesting. I was looking at the Vander Clay videos and Ver Veracki, and he's been doing a number of videos. And I've noticed mm -hmm. about uh, Paul that he is a uh, more of a sensing lawyer type. Extra, he's extremely extroverted. He's really out there, and he's really in sync with that extroverted function, sensing, and everything. Mm -hmm. kind of 
you know, you've been able to do that because, uh, you know, of your intuitive thinking uh, combination. Sure. You've been able to, you know, get in that terrain back and forth between each side of the Eros and the Logos. Mm -hmm. uh, what Paul needs to do is he needs to go the other direction back to Eros a little bit because he's just, uh, and how to do that, I don't know. My suggestion is he just needs to sit down and read Young. Yeah, we yeah. have we have to get into an experience of God. That's what I'm well, talking and, about. And Young can take you there just reading it. So sure, uh, you have to sit down. You have to read it, and it's going to be painful. It's going to be hard to do, uh, but eventually, if you read that, he structured that document in uh, a way to uh, enable you to go down into the psyche uh, the way that he's written all these uh, uh, you know he wrote this on purpose he did not write it just to be hard to read you're talking about the red book well any book that he's written he's yeah well, that's true the way because you know how hard it is to read well uh, yeah he, 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 he definitely wrote everything he ever wrote based on a rational approach to the irrational Right. And then he turns it on its end, you know, and goes off somewhere and then you have to come back and then he gets you off your guard. And that's the whole purpose is to get you out of your habitual way of doing something. Right. And then that causes you to take another look at uh, what's coming. Absolutely. So Mama Lama says the positive in learning to recover and heal from personal traumas is that it prepares us for the much harder work to bridge our transpersonal trauma to take the next leap for evolution in consciousness. Um, and uh, sorry, not meant to be dismissive of trauma. I know something of how hard that can be. And yeah, I'm, I don't think anybody would be dismissive of trauma. Uh, and we all have trauma, obviously. Uh, throughout our lives, but some people have it much worse than others. And Dr. Kalshid is talking about very young children who are abused by their parents, and then they get this dissociated situation where their, their spiritual self is separated from their somatic self, and they can't make a connection back. And that's what religion is supposed to do for you. And and that's why you should you feel better if you go to church if you don't if you go to Skip. church and you don't feel better then that's not good go ahead miles yeah and uh, to think that you know logos and cleaning up your room will be the solution uh, can be very misleading uh, because and i'm not a psychologist i'm just always learning and very interested uh since discovering psychology and, and discovering you and Jung. But most recently, listening to Dr. Gabor Mate, mm -hmm. who is a, is a medical doctor who started to try to understand why there are so many mentally ill people that he encountered. And then he started to reflect on his own mental illness, or at least an addiction to buying music CDs. But anyway, uh, talking about trauma and the soul, he established that it is, or, you know, I'm not saying he's the only one that established this, but he's very much about people need to recognize that so many people who are in jails, so many people who are living in tents, it's because they suffered childhood trauma and it's never been attended to. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, and then you know, take about take homelessness for example. I just the other day listened to Dr. Drew in Los Angeles. You may know Dr. Drew. He was the celebrity psychologist to, on a TV show not too long ago. Anyway, he is very committed to trying to help the the people living in tents mm -hmm. in Los Angeles and other major cities. And in some of these cities, it's getting serious. He says there could be. Um, typhoid outbreaks or bubonic plague re re reoccurring because of the unsanitary conditions. And he says, it's not a homeless problem because indeed Los Angeles has absorbed 800,000 
immigrants uh, who have, you know, come across the border and and maybe are illegal, but they they have um, gotten themselves into housing and they're productive. Maybe they're illegal, but they're productive members of the city. The people living in tents, if you said we have an apartment around the corner, they will not go to it. They're mm -hmm. so um, men tra tra traumatically damaged that telling them to clean up their room or here's an apartment, go live in it, is not going to, they're going to yeah. still be on that, in that tent. Anyway, just a few thoughts. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, we have a serious mental health problem that, you know, used to be partially addressed by religion and partially addressed by a more aggressive mental health treatment, I think. And Certainly, and since the 60s or so, we start to see uh, psychiatrists and psychologists, I don't know about psychologists, but psychiatrists can certainly throw pills at it. And what do we get? We were killing more people in a year on the opioid ep epidemic than we killed in the whole Vietnam War. And we've got a big monument down the road from me that has 58,000 names on it. And that's fewer than we kill every year with the opioid epidemic. So we have a serious issue in this country with mental health, as uh, we should all know if we watch the evening news anymore. Um, Tiffany Vu says, um, hmm, how can we understand the anima in males? Well, that's pretty easy, uh, Tiffany. Excuse the excursion for those of you who are um, more um, been around longer than Tiffany, but I'll share this with Tiffany at least. Uh, this is my anima, and that is an image of my mother. Uh, when she was 18 years old, I was born about a year later. And um, whenever I see a woman with long brown hair like this and dark eyes, it doesn't, the pearl necklace doesn't really add much, but whenever I see a woman with, with these eyes and this hair, uh, my animus says, that's the woman for you. <laughs> and it's only in my uh, dotage that I have figured out that this is my anima trying to control me. And, uh, and so, and, you know, manage my life accordingly. I mean, one, both my first and second wives met with that, met that template precisely. And obviously I changed wives in the, ex, in the expectation that um, my life would be better and it is better. Uh, but uh, if I had understood some things about psychology that I now understood, I might not have done it. Um, and I might be with my first wife still. And so uh, the anima is an image that a male has in his psyche or the animus is in a woman's psyche and every woman basically looks for her father. And my first wife was definitely like that. I mean, she expected me to be like her father and I simply couldn't do it for a number of reasons. Uh, her father was a, a handyman and a, um, he loved to tinker and work out in the garden and in his lawn, which was never me because I'm allergic to everything that's green and grows. And so <laughs> I was never, I mean, I remember one time at his house, I was cutting the grass one time and I had this push mower and there's this hill there next to their house. And I pushed this push mower up this hill to get the grass on the hill. And I, I just started sneezing uncontrollably. And I literally flipped the mower 
right over my head and could easily have cut my head off. <laughs> that was my that was my life before I realized that these were allergies that could be controlled with with shots, which I've been getting since I was 25 now. But at that time, I didn't know that. And so I was never going to be an outdoorsman handyman. I, I was an outdoorsman in the U.S. Marines, but that's different. You have a lot of adrenaline running when you're in the Marine Corps, and, and that seems to control it. But, um, but in any case, uh, and uh, my my ex father in law, um, he literally built my wife's my ex wife's house around her. When she was one year old, he moved his family into an unfinished basement in a building that was not complete, and he literally built the house around his family, and. Um, that was never going to be my forte, obviously, because I'm a bit of a nerd and intellectual, I guess, is what some people might call me. And so that was never going to be my way of life. But it took us 17 years to figure out that that wasn't going to happen. And uh, unfortunately, it it caused uh, our split and that wasn't a happy thing for either of us and we're still um, quite close but it's more like sister and brother today than than like uh, enemies or like uh, the lovers we used to be so anyway i hope that's meaningful to you tiffany the same anything i said about men can be reversed on women with the animus, I think. Any comments there? Well, other than it's just uh, the, uh, it's a projection that's you project upon the other person. Right. And so you, you need to uh, withdraw that projection or be aware that that projection comes up some of the uh, archetypes and some of the things cannot be resolved they just come up and come back and you just learn to say oh i know what that is yeah well that's that's precisely true jerome and and the problem is that we don't educate young people about psychology adequately at all right. for for the most part not at all and so when we don't educate our young people about psychology, and then we have 50% divorce rates, uh, we're reaping the whirlwind. I mean, we, you know, if we would educate people about psychology and about uh, how a mar marriage works and, and so on, uh, we'd have a lot happier country, I think. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Miles, you want to... I'll just add that with respect to my perspective on anima, you know, I've, I, before encountering you and Jung until very recently, I had no concept of an anima who is on, on my way or is a part of that access of the ego self access. And in a sense, you know, I'm, obligated to encounter this anima and I suppose it's made me stop to think well how is it that my brain as a man is thinks different than a tip uh, generally a female mind so in other words I am logos I am the one that would have said oh we've got homelessness let's just build some homes for these people you know, whereas, no, right. the solution for all of these people who are so traumatized is Eros. Right. You know, I have to, I have to stop thinking Logos and think Eros to solve that problem. Precisely. And, yeah. And so I now realize, okay, I now appreciate that to me, you know, I've been married for a little over 20 years and that's an education because 
you know, I lived as single man, male show, uh, bachelor life for quite a few years. And, you know, I just did my thing and played my golf and, you know, only had to think about me. But now I realize, wow, you know, I, I did something like changed the game plan on my wife 20 years ago when I said, well, we'll go and we'll have you know, pie at this restaurant. And then in between, I at the service station got an ice cream and she doesn't let me forgive, forget that, you know, it was like, well, what's the big deal? I saw ice cream. I wanted ice cream. I bought ice cream. We could still go for pie, but no, for her, it was, you were supposed to wait until we had pie anyway, you know, and she'll come up with these three. She'll remember these things. What the heck are you talking about? I can't even remember that. But now that you mentioned it, okay, it's coming back to me. Anyway, it's, um, I guess, so the anima, now that I realize that it needs to be part of me is to appreciate that women are, you know, very different in their thinking and they're not just objects for us men, but we need to appreciate what they bring to the table. Well, we have to, we have to think about what Dr. Edinger said, Edward Edinger, who said, um, mother nature is imperious and, Mother Nature wants us to um, reproduce. She doesn't care if you get married, but Mother Nature wants you to reproduce. And, um, and you're, you know, good chance you're going to reproduce because mother, mother Nature is imperious. And the way she gets you to do that is she puts the opposite in your psyche so that you know what you're looking for. Um, Right. And so that's why the image of my mother informs me about what I should be looking for in a wife. Right. In a, in a very low resolution way, but nonetheless, that's what it does. And so anyway, Carlos, do you have a comment on this? Uh, yeah, I kind of wanted to step in and defend the logos a little bit because you guys are butchering it so badly. Um, I think the reason psychologists focus on the logos is because that's the only way, the only part of the Jungian system that you can control behaviorally. Like you can keep your room clean, but you can't really control what happens to you metaphysically. And also what's part of the reason people are put on prescriptions so much, so often and so quickly is that people kill themselves when they're depressed. So anything that we can do to kind of prevent people from taking that route is taken right away. Yeah. yeah. Youth will be served often on silver platters. <laughs> my only, well, my only observation uh, is that, you know, young men are convinced of the logos and our whole society is aimed at that. And, you know, certainly I was taken over by the logos and, you know, becoming a lawyer, becoming a Marine, all those uh, things, you know, becoming a Marine, be a hero, uh, live the hero archetype and all that. And all of our, um, practically all of our entertainment, almost every program, show or movie is about heroics and in one way or another. And, and so that's all uh, very rational and it's trying to convince us to a certain way of life. Um, but we have to have a balanced life. In the end, we have to have a balanced life. And, um, and so, um, you know, I, I'm not a mental health professional. Carlos, so I'm not going to say when people should and should not take medication and whether it's appropriate or not. Uh, I just say that, you know, is this the best we can do when, when we're killing so many people, tens of thousands of people every year with op opioid addiction? Now, I know a lot of those people, you know, got themselves into it one way or another and not because of, of, um, prescriptions from psychiatrists. Um, 
And, you know, lots of them get into it because they've had back surgery or knee surgery or what have you. Uh, my, um, my uh, surgeon that replaced my knee uh, told me that he had another patient who was a former Marine and uh, he kept coming back to this doctor for prescriptions for a year. And, and so then he, he was quite amazed by me because uh, after I left the hospital, I took one dose only and uh, then went to non-prescription uh, pain medicine for mine. And, um, you know, I never had any problem with it, but, you know, obviously this other Marine, supposedly great heroic guy, um, you know, just, uh, he was somehow addicted and, you know, he wasn't addicted by my, my, uh, orthopedic surgeon, but he was obviously addicted when he came in and he was using the orthopod as a way to get more, um, painkillers. And, and so we, you know, we have to be very careful about that. And, uh, I know a very, I, I, a very close friend of mine who's a family doctor is adamant that he will not give anybody a prescription just because they ask for it. And, you know, they have people show up at their practice every day who want, who just want a prescription for painkillers and he won't do it. But unfortunately, many medical doctors do do it. And so it's something that we have to be conscious of. And so I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm sure that there are appropriate uses for um, medication. I know Jordan Peterson's mentioned that he uh, does have a, a problem with depression and that he takes medication for it. Um, and, you know, I have no idea how he, um, how that was prescribed to him, but he, he's mentioned that a couple of times in lectures. And, um, and so, you know, these, these things are nuanced, obviously there's a broad spectrum. And what I, I mean, I've had a number of people come, come to me. Um, one person who came to me saying he was suicidal and, um, at one point, uh, and his comment to me was that I communicated to him more effectively than any psychotherapist he talked to. Now, why that would be, I don't know. Um, but, um, you know, we have a friendship and I, I speak to him only as a friend. Um, and I don't try to to be his doctor, um, but you know it's an interesting fact, and so what we we have to think about having our psychiatrists and psychologists think rethink how they're going about these things. I guess uh, you know it's not all roses and rainbows, and one of the points that um, Dr. Kalshit is making here is that when you're reconnecting, when, when somebody's in the situation that this woman is, where she, he's reconnecting their somatic body with their spiritual body. In other words, body and mind or logos and eros, um, he has to take them back to this very painful time and then let them create a narrative that they can live with and, and that's the problem. If we apparently, and uh, you know, I'm operating blind here now, so I'm not a mental health professional, this is just skip yam yammering, but um, you know, apparently what we need is to be able to explain to ourselves in narrative how certain things came about and you know, whether they're our fault or not. Um, and in, in the rest of this chapter, Dr. Kalsha 
says that this woman courageously went back to the those early memories so that they could then um, rebuild the narrative between her uh, psyche and her physical body. And, and that helped her quite dramatically. Uh, he dedicated a chapter to her, so I guess so. Um, so let me, um, let me look at a couple of comments and then I'll come back to you. Uh, Megan says, Tiffany, I highly recommend Iron John by Robert Bly for a Jungian perspective on male psychology. I believe it touches on the anima very definitely, Megan. That's a good reference. Uh, Law, uh, Lord Awesome Tony says, I think we uh, our work similarly with different premises behind our background. Do we know that neuroplasticity isn't the thing guilty of producing a special specific type of a person? Um, I don't know, that's, that's way above my pay grade. Uh, Lord awesome, you're, you're more awesome than I am because I'm not a mental health professional. So I don't know any of the details of what you're talking about. I barely understand the word, the words that you're using or the, the word neuroplasticity. I'm sorry, I just don't know. And I, I don't hold myself out to be a mental health professional. Mama says, another good book on trauma recovery is Waking the Tiger. Sounds like similar work in this book you are discussing. Uh, that may be, I haven't read that book, but thank you for the reference. Okay, going back, uh, comments on my other yammering. I was sort of free associating there for a while. Well, I guess I'll just add another thing about logos. I'm all for logos. I love logos. I work for a railway and running trains on single track. You gotta follow the rules. Right. You know, thank thank goodness. An hour. Thank goodness there are men and thank goodness there are logos because as I say, everything that you can see in this picture behind me was made by and logos a hundred percent. Yeah, and you know, like for example, I just <clears throat> was watching videos about the Dodge Demon, the new Dodge Demon. It can do zero to 60 in 2.3 seconds. It's <laughs> the fastest production car ever. It's specifically for drag racing. But, you know, and so, you know, we would talk for an hour about these cars, all of us, I'm pretty sure here, especially Carlos, where he's sitting. However, as I got older, I realized there's some serious problems in, on this planet. And I think starting to appreciate the, you know, maybe I do need to cultivate an anima to totally understand why some of these problems exist has been very enlightening for me, you know. But well, at least you more have power to, logos. <laughs> at least you have to um, uh, cultivate an interest in life, okay? Because I mean, I remember when I was in Vietnam, uh, we would sit. We we had what was called the PACX catalog, the Pacific Exchange catalog. So it was basically a Sears catalog that had all these fancy uh, stereo systems and uh, chinaware and flatware, all kinds of things, everything that you could possibly want in a household, but would be entirely useless in Vietnam. And so we were allowed to sit there and dream about these things while we were in Vietnam and, and then order them and ship them back to our, our spouses. Uh, directly, so they wouldn't come through Vietnam. In other words, the the order was coming out of Hawaii or something like that. And I remember sitting around our sea huts in the evening, just talking about the pros and cons of this speaker or that amplifier, and isn't this going to be wonderful? And of course, we couldn't hear these things. They, we were just talking, and we were just yammering on about all these specifications, which is what men love to do. Okay, exactly what men love to do, but there's no life in that. And 
And, uh, you know, I wasn't thinking about it at the time, but by that time, I already had a very serious case of tinnitus. Um, and I still have it. And I got it on the pistol range at Quantico uh, when I was training as a second lieutenant. And I still have it. And I, if I meditate on it, I can, I can consciously identify 12 frequencies of tinnitus. And so, you know, it wasn't going to, that stereo gear wasn't going to make a, a hoots difference to me in terms of what I could hear, <laughs> whether it would mean anything to me in my life, nothing. <laughs> but we spent a lot of evenings talking about that stuff and uh, sort of uh, kind of mutual masturbation, I suppose. Um, and, uh, but that, that there's no life in that. Okay. You, you can talk about all the stuff all, all the time. And we need, we need Logos a hundred percent when we're making any product. Absolutely. Um, but you know, there's no life in the Logos. You know, if, Jordan Peterson can say whatever he wants in his classroom, but once you leave his classroom and graduate from university, then you have to go live your life, and that's different. If you're somebody that has a mental illness like OCD or bipolar or borderline, then you probably also have like a very serious issues maintaining logos in your life because of your condition. So might be true. Yeah. So if we can start by keeping your room clean and then through some behavioral cognitive therapy, we can then find the underlining reasons for your trauma, but it's usually a good place to start. You know, the one thing you can, you can grasp, you know, you can work out, you can clean your room, you can be a good person. Yeah. I, nothing wrong with that, Carlos. I, you know, I agree that, you know, we have a lot of, young men who are nihilistic right now because they haven't been able to find a meaning to their life. And it's not hard to find a meaning in your life. All you have to do is go out and start living one. <laughs> and and uh, you're, you know, it might kill you, but it, you know, it's definitely going to give you meaning, whatever that meaning might be. And, um, And so I, you know, I agree that, you know, we have to have rules. I mean, in the, in the Marine Corps, the, the rules are very, very specific. Everybody wears the resume on their chest and their rank insignia on their shoulders. And everybody knows every, how everybody fits in the pecking order all the time. Okay. And so there's never any doubt about who's in charge. Okay. And and there's no arrows in that, okay? It, this is the way it is. If the commander in chief wants it this way, boom. You know, if the, if the commander in chief says, you know, go out over the horizon, kill that son of a bitch and come back, you say, aye, aye, sir, how high? <laughs> you know, or how many? <laughs> and and uh, so that's 100% uh, logos. There's almost no reason, no, room for divergence from that. However, um, and almost everybody, Marines would always come to me and say, just tell me how to, what you want done in the mission and I will do it precisely, but do not involve me in the politics. And the problem is that everything is politics at the, at the higher levels, okay? Once you're over 30, everything is politics. And so you have to learn how to, how to navigate the politics and you can be a hero. You know, you can win yourself a medal of honor and when you're 19 or whatever it is, and you're a hero. Um, but until you learn the other side of life, the, the part that's irrational, um, you don't have a balanced life. That's what I would say. And so, yes, I mean, Logos is very good for people that need 
uh, structure and direction. Uh, my, my criticism of Dr. Peterson is he prescribes that to everyone without differentiation. Well, and I, I'd add, you know, personally speaking, that reflecting on environmental issues and getting a wide perspective of different belief systems and including indigenous people's views where they see the planet as a living mother earth that makes a lot of sense because you know i i studied i became a civil engineer and we were taught okay you want a dam you build the dam just put it in that river and in fact that's what they've done and to a lot of rivers and you know today we uh, have impaired salmon fisheries because of it um, there's other things that have been done to Mother Earth where if there was more of an Eros perspective, we wouldn't have some of the situations we're dealing with today. That's my right. opinion. And, and Miles, I, I thought of you on, on this, but let me just re respond here to one thing. Was Carl Jung intuitive? And how do you make it, make the unconscious conscious? Okay, so... Carl Jung was intuitive beyond imagination and uh, way more intuitive than I am. And I'm on, in the 99th percentile on the Myers-Briggs. So he was way out there, <laughs> intuitive, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but Miles, I, um, I stopped reading uh, one paragraph short, I guess, on Deborah's condition and I thought of you because I, I'll just pick it up in the middle of the paragraph where he say, he's talking about how part of her cure was connecting to the collective unconscious. And then what he says is this, what Jung called the collective unconscious popularly known among primal peoples was the spirit world. In Deborah's case, the spirit world helped her with its healing powers through her dreams, her love of nature, her creative childhood play with dolls and in adolescence through the Native American traditions where she read Native, where she read Native legends and studied Hopi and Navajo religious practices. In the alternative world supplied by these latter Aboriginal traditions, her own Aboriginal self could relax and feel at home. Uh, so, so anyway, I, you'll be very interested in reading that chapter of Dr. Kolshid's book because he does refer to um, Native practices and, and so on, like, like Native religious practices and talks about how those can be extremely healing. Um, and, so, uh, and so Tiffany asks, how do you make the unconscious conscious? Uh, well, it's, it's a lifelong process, Tiffany, and I'll, I'll give you an example of how it worked this morning. Um, I was in the kitchen cooking my wife's omelet, as I do each morning, and uh, I came out of the kitchen, and the television is on, and we have a 55-inch television, fortunately, and all of a sudden, the entire picture was centered in the in the uh, image and there's a foot of blackness around, <laughs> around the picture and I'm saying what the heck happened what did you do and she says i don't know you know <laughs> she says you know not my problem and so we tried the other stations and sure enough it was on all the stations so she left and left that problem to me and so then um, I looked down on the remote for the Sanyo, I think it's a Sanyo TV we have. And on the remote, it says uh, P size, which stands for picture size. So I push that button and sure enough, there comes, there comes up a menu that says, do you want full size or do you want limited size? And so apparently she had accidentally pushed that button and um, and changed our TV without realizing it. 
And so she's still unconscious of this right now, um, but either tonight or tomorrow morning, I'm going to make her conscious of something that she did unconsciously. So we, we have to consciously, we have to, um, making the unconscious conscious is a lifelong procedure and obviously, when you go to university, as Carlos is doing, I think now, um, you become more and more conscious because people are teaching you concepts and the ways to think about things and you're learning to be an adult and that sort of thing. And, and if you hadn't gone to university, if you dropped out in the eighth grade, you would, would be unconscious of all those things. And so the way you make uh, the unconscious conscious is commit yourself to a lifelong education. And, uh, and if you continue to follow us down the path with Dr. Young, um, it, it will be a lifetime process, or at least as long as I have a breath and ability to connect to this channel. Um, it will be, it will continue because I've been at this for three years now and uh, I haven't even touched the surface and I haven't even gotten into the red book at all yet. And um, I think most of us are ready for that now. So anyway, I think that's the best I can do for an answer. I, others, other comments on that? I was just wondering if you wanted to share how you vision approaching your first meetup at the church hall that you're planning to possibly rent. How, how are you, how do you see introducing people gently, you know, and. I wasn't thinking, them... I wasn't thinking of doing it gently. Um, oh, just jump in. You like to talk extemporaneously, so. Well, that's one thing, because then I know I'm talking from the right brain uh, if I do that. I mean, I, I used to, when I was in college and law school and so on, I, I had everything written out, every speech I ever gave in those years, I wrote out word for word and I read it word for word, and there was no life in that. And I know that now, looking back on it. And I also know that when I speak extemporaneously, as I do in these sessions, um, then you're getting the best of my right brain um, and the best of myself as opposed to my ego. My, if I had written it all out, you'd get, be getting my ego. And uh, so... Um, I, a mixed emotion, but I'm going to think about it, Jerome and Miles, especially about how to arrange this thing. My idea is that I, I'm already being, going to be uh, throwing a bucket of cold water on people, okay, because I'm not, in, in this talk, um, I'm not going to um, mollycoddle any faith tradition. Um, I'm going to say, among other things, um, you know, when you die, you don't know you're dead. It's only difficult for your family. And when you're stupid, it works the same way. <laughs> Here's an idea. How about, uh, you know, images as you're very visual and you paint and you have all those uh, paintings that you have done in the past. And in addition, the, the little puffer fish and the mandala, that video segment, you know, just to get people like, wow, where is this coming from? This yeah. puffer fish that builds the mandala, mandala would be, you know, and then it's like, well, where do we go with that? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the topics that I want to talk about, obviously. And... Um, you know, I think that's a good suggestion, Miles. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, hit them with the aesthetic uh, type of thing. And you've got to move their uh, current thinking when they walk in uh, back down to where you want to take them, which yeah. is where you naturally are when you're extemporaneous. Uh, yeah. here, here, here's a hot flash 
this is human related, but this is the earliest human mandala that's been found. Right. And it's, uh, it's, in, um, it's in Kimberley, Australia. And it is 50,000 years old. Now the puffer fish that you mentioned, I happen to keep these things on my desktop nowadays. Um, for those who haven't been with us previously, um, for in the 1990s, divers in the Sea of Japan were discuss, discovering what they thought were the equivalent of crop circles in the sea, in the, in the inland sea of Japan. And so they were trying to figure out what these mandalas, how they were created. And what they ultimately found is that these mandalas are this. Let me show you. Let's see. Okay, this is again Mother Nature being imperious in that this is the puffer fish. This is the fish that the Japanese call the fugu fish. Um, and the fugu fish is um, poisonous to humans. And it, you can have fugu at a uh, sushi restaurant, provided you have a sushi chef who knows how to remove the liver of this fish before it explodes and, and with its poison that would kill you. And um, this fish is five inches long. And what it does when it's ready for mating, now we're talking about Mother Nature being imperious again, uh, this is the male fugu fish who creates this mandala over a five day period. And the typical size of these things is seven feet in diameter. The fugu fish is five inches long. And this is how he creates the mandala. And the idea is that if he creates a good enough mandala, then the female fugu fish will come into the middle of this mandala and lay her eggs, which he will then uh, fertilize. And then his DNA will be carried down to the next generation. But if he hasn't made a good enough mandala, then he's all done. He's cooked. And... So another thing that'll work well with that is you have quite a collection of animals who portray the mother and father archetype. We had, we had just this, this spring, like early summer, we had a family of crows in a tree that we could watch from the kitchen mm -hmm. and really amazing to see the mother and father crow tending to these three little crows that eventually hatched and then watching the crows, the baby crows venture out onto branches. And then one finally tumbled down and spent the rest of the day trying to hop back up to the nest. And, and then they ventured out like toddlers. Um, one landed on a branch and, and then another baby came along and landed plopped down beside the first one, but the branch would they chose to sit on was so flimsy, the branch just flung down, <laughs> the one let go, and then that slingshotted the, the remaining one off into the air. You know, just like a couple of toddlers, you know, playing right. around. And, but anyway, you know, then you, you, so you introduce your, those, those images would be great too, because so, you're talking the living God that's, you, you're emphasizing the Eros, I imagine. And yeah. you have your John 1 chapters, uh, 1 through 6, but you take them right through to 13. Right. Then, you know, you're off to the races. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, so Megan says, what are your thoughts on the Enneagram? Um, I don't have many thoughts on this, uh, Megan. I, we did a couple of sessions at... Uh, at Sammy's a, a few weeks ago uh, on the Enneagram, and you might want to go back and look at those. Um, but um, it's it's an 
uh, I would call it an irrational way to get to some reality about the way your psyche works. And it's, um, and I, I guess yesterday, um, Murray Stein said that mystical things are just science that we don't understand yet. And, you know, there, that might be true. It happens that I actually have put a 18 video uh, training program on the Tarot on this channel. And uh, I do Tarot and, and it is, you know, it definitely works because of scientific and psychological facts. Uh, but if you're not familiar with it, and it's useful, even if you know the secret, which I do, uh, because it causes you to connect synchronous in a synchronous way to your unconscious. If, if I do a tarot reading for myself, I will definitely kick over some of the furniture in my psyche, and then I'll have to pull it back together again. And that's kind of what the Enneagram does. And it's uh, what astrology does and uh, lots of other divination techniques, tea leaves and every other divination technique. They basically uh, kick over the, the furniture in your psyche and make you re rebuild yourself. Um, and you're doing this in real time. And so the Enneagram like the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs Briggs test, uh, are ways to present to you um, how you are and, and help you understand yourself, as in the Oracle at Delphi, know yourself. Um, I went to um, the Center for Creative Leadership a number of years ago, about close to 20 years ago, I suppose, but uh, that's in Greenville, nor, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Green, yeah. Green. yeah, Greensboro. And, um, and every selected brigadier general in the army is required to go to the Center for Creative Leadership. And they have a, an exercise a simulation that they do uh, called the looking glass. The, that is a two two hour or two day sim, simulation, and basically, what it does it's a it's an inbox outbox box process where you're operating a company, and at the end of it, uh, then your your cohorts uh, have the chance to tell you what they think of you, <laughs> and and. Uh, so it's called looking glass because what they do is they hold this mirror up to you and say, this is you, you like it. <laughs> it's a skiff. I went to that also the looking glass program, at the center for clear leadership. So what you say is very true because they hold up the mirror and your, your peers or your group that you're with also give feedback as well as the facilitators. And it can be quite uh, revealing, and but you learn from that. Oh, definitely. I mean, the the most hilarious ones were uh, there were there were these two guys that were from a construction company in New Jersey. So they were uh, part of uh, you know what, and uh, and so they came in on the first night and they were drinking at the bar and they were tough and they didn't know why they'd been sent to this thing by their boss and and they weren't going to learn anything by this and boy at the end of this program just five days later they were totally different men incredibly i mean they were incredibly arrogant when they came in and they were uh, definitely opened up <laughs> <laughs> eviscerated <laughs> and then had to rebuild themselves at the end of it because of that and uh did you have any similar experiences during there uh yeah well actually uh my mentors uh was one of the founders of this 
Center for Creative Leadership who left and formed his own firm. Uh, mm -hmm. So he taught creative leadership and self-awareness. And that's where you really get into uh, what we would call stripping off the barriers and blocks that, that you defend yourself with. And you really open yourself up and you're just down there at the bottom with nothing. You're just vulnerable. And you, you have that experience of what it's like just to be unencumbered and to actually see the real, the real or the real world as you've seen. Right. Uh, for instance, when you did your, uh, uh, what was it, the christening, you saw the light in people's eyes and so forth. Yeah, their it, faces lit up, yeah. Right, that's the experience right there. Sure. There it is. Yeah. Um, let's see. Sean is here and uh, says, uh, sounds like it translates into human narrative. What What do you think about, about the ego being immortal and it longs for death in a sort of mandala fashion like the fish? The ego longs for the death because it can never die, maybe. Wow. Um, just playing off what you said. Uh, what I would say is that, according to Dr. Jung, uh, the ego does um, set as a goal death at some point in your life when you're getting near to the end, and death actually becomes a goal. And we're, we currently have in our immediate friends, uh, the father of one of our close friends who, um, yeah, he just wants to die. He's a he's a medical doctor, as a matter of fact, and he just wants to die. And uh, they keep coming and bringing him back <laughs> as a professional courtesy, believe it or not. And, and he's not very happy about it. But in terms of um, the ego being immortal, I would say uh, that you better put that one on the shelf because uh, what will be immortal is um, your spirit and your soul expressed through your spirit. And if, um, and in order for that to be immortal, it has to be based on the works during your lifetime. Because when, once you're dead, you're dead. You don't know you're dead. And it's only difficult for your family. And so there is immortality, as we know. We're talking this evening about Dr. Young's work, and he's been dead for, um, what, nearly 60 years. And, um, you know, there's no question that the spirit of Jesus Christ is still alive, and that of the Buddha, and that of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and that of Ludwig von Beethoven, and any number of others that we could name. But is their physical ego still alive? Absolutely not. And did Jesus Christ, um, did, his, did he physically ascend into heaven? Um, yeah, okay, I'll accept that as a psychic fact. But as a physical fact, it's not. Um, because as Dr. Young said in answer to Job, every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche, not a statement of the physis. And so, um, you know, if it, if it floats your boat to believe, as uh, Paul Vanderclay insists, that Jesus Christ uh, ascended into heaven bodily, physically, and now the Virgin Mary did also. Um, those are psychic facts, and I accept them as psychic facts. Are they physical facts? No, they're not. Um, and uh, sorry to break anybody's bubble on that, but I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to molly coddle anyone on this channel. <laughs> Is that too hard? Miles or Jerome or Carlos? Am I being... Oh, I would, I would just say that, uh, you know, the, the psyche uh, goes on. It doesn't realize that you're dead. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, in fairness, in fairness, you know, you're, you're uh, a psyche having a physical life, not a physical 
being having a psychic life. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, and I think, you know, for me, uh, first of all, a plug for the good service lawyers provide, and that is everybody should have a little bit living will because you never know, no matter how old you are, that you could have an aneurysm and all of a sudden you're incapacitated and you may actually really wish you could die, but modern technology, like you described your friend, they have these amazing abilities now to bring us back, even though that might not be our intention. So a living will is, is having somebody you know knows your wishes and that they can make decisions in those situations. Anyway, yeah. I just shared that because it was a coincidence today that I heard somebody talking about uh, the dangers no, well, of not being prepared. Well, I, I, I concur with that, although ruefully, because uh, my wife is, uh, uh, works at Hospice of the Chesapeake, and um, she ins insists on living wills everywhere. So she's, She's got living wills uh, fastened to the refrigerator door. She's got uh, half of the glove compartment of our car filled up with printouts of our living wills, all signed, sealed, and delivered. Every okay. So she's like, here's me thinking I've got to get onto this. And, <laughs> and there's her. So she, she's like over the other side. Oh, yeah. She's, she's, <laughs> she's, wow. got, she's got all that covered. I mean, the, the living But I think there's some... You know, getting back to psychic facts, though, there's things that I think are psychic facts that we should be concerned about. Like, I have a hard time fathoming that, you know, at any given moment, a uh, nuclear war could break out and we would all be, you know, cooked in, a, in short order. Like, that's a psychic fact. I sure. can't really get my head around it, but we should act, be acting as if it's true. You know? well, it is true. Yeah, and <laughs> not as if that, and that's another problem I have with Dr. Peterson because he he wants to live as if because he's over on the logo side, and so he wants to say he lives as if God is real, and and the fact is God is real, God is real, and. Um, and, and our capacity to destroy the planet is real, too. Absolutely. Even though, you know, my, I've never witnessed a nuclear blast, but I'll have to trust that nobody doctored all these images and that indeed everything that these people report, you know. So, yeah, we have to act as if God is true and we have to act if, as if men, mankind, can destroy the planet. We should not, work on not, solving Not this. as if. We yeah, have okay. To work as as though they can because they can and um you know especially in my youth when i was living in japan in the early 60s going to high school there um i would very frequently see survivors from hiroshima and um and so i was actually physically seeing the consequences of nuclear weapons and those nuclear weapons, as Dr. Young said in paragraph 950 or 751 of Answer to Job, he said, um, you know, it, it wasn't uh, the uranium or the laboratory equipment that created the atom bomb. It was, uh, and it wasn't a non-real psyche that created it. It was a real psyche. Everything that you see behind me was created by a real psyche before it was manifested through the logos, um, including all of us, okay? Because I don't see any, any living plants in any of our pictures. So uh, short of living plants, everything in, in this image is uh, the result of imagination because you can't produce anything through the logos, you can't manifest anything through the logos until it's first been imagined. Um, and once it's been imagined, then fine, engineers can go to work and they can, they can, through the logos, figure out how to make something, whatever it is. Everything has to be made. Even this pen has to be 
you know, somebody had to do a design for this pen and then it had to be worked out how to manufacture it. And, you know, the manufacturing process is, is huge. I mean, um, I used to be involved, believe it or not, in um, automobile weather stripping. And it's just incredible to see what goes into just the, the plastic and rubber that goes around your windshield and around your uh, your movable car windows and and so on that just keeps the rain off you and you go into a factory where they're doing this and they're doing it with uh, plastic extrusion equipment and uh, rubber molding which uh, requires a huge Banbury mixer it's like three stories high and takes up a hundred yards of space inside a building and it's smelly and and so on, all these things require, and all those things had to be imagined and produced also through the logos. And that's why the women keep us men around because we're interested in that. <laughs> you know, and talking about things being manufactured of great destructive capability, uh, such as nuclear weapons, uh, this fellow Wolfgang Pauli is a fascinating individual and I don't know very much about him. Have you done m many readings or essays related to him? Well, there's a book called Adam and Archetype, which is uh, a sharing of the, uh, the correspondence between Pauli and Dr. Jung. Um, and that specifically is talking about archetypal things because beyond that, in um, in psychology and alchemy, there's about a quarter of it is devoted to the dreams of Dr. Pauli's individuation process, including a lot of pictures of it. Um, but and um, Dr. Arst yesterday, who is also a physicist, as it happens, um, yesterday mentioned that uh, he's been working on the Pauli. Um, young relationship for about 20 years and uh, I haven't had a chance to look back and see what he's said about it let me just quickly look at his description here um, okay various publications in natural philosophy in the context of Wolfgang Pauli and C.G. Jung Unus Mundus Cosmos und Sympathy. Now, Dr. Arst is a German, so he wrote these as, as ger in German, but Philosophia Naturalis and Wolfgang Pauli und der Geist der Materie. So Wolfgang Pauli and uh, the spirit of matter is what I guess that says. And let's see. So he's written a lot about it. I don't know. How I much. wonder if you could engage him in more interviews on this subject. I'm sure I could. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, let's see. It's uh, editor of a German series, Studentia Ruinzer Analytici Psychology. Um, I'm not sure I understand students on analytical psychology or something, but he's apparently written three books on the relationship. So yes, um, the the main next thing I have to do with Dr. Arst is um, find a way to promote the red books that he's promoting. Uh, and so he's quite interested in that. And I, as I said, I received an email about that just before we started tonight. So, um, that's a that's wonderful a ongoing much to look forward to yeah very much to look forward to now um i'm gonna just finish up with some comments here and then uh we're going to have to wrap this up mama says hey skip have you ever read the gospel of christian atheism that was one book i came across that first introduced me to the concept of the living God. I appreciate that link. I'll take a look at that because that's obviously right on the point I want to be. And Are You Forces, 
Sean, perhaps the ego longs for death to free the spirit. Yeah, maybe. And um, Sean says something not related as much is the is integrated a sort of idea given to, given till you feel pain, and that's how you know you've done some good. Yeah, that's a good one. Are you for says my friend's grandfather committed suicide at 89 because he said life had become too painfully painful physically. I'm sure that can happen. And mama says the ego must die to its need to control the spirit if it is to transcend and join in selfhood. Um, I'm sure that's also true. Mama, that's a very good um, good point. Okay, uh, gentlemen, I, it so happens that this room in which I operate is also the bedroom that I have to share with Lana. So, or I'm not sharing it with Lana, but Lana has to sleep here. So I have to give up this room. And uh, so I have to excuse myself for tonight. So Very it's, enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank all the people on YouTube for all the useful chats we've had this evening. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Skip. Okay, take care. Nice seeing you tonight. Bye-bye.